Hi, this is Steps in a Journey. I'm Kathy Moore, and this is a class on the spiritual life as we journey together for the eternal life. We are reading Confessions right now by Augustine, and we're on chapter 8, and we'll, uh, book 8, and we'll start with chapter 6. And this is a story of, of Augustine's conversion. All through his book, there are many, many steps toward his conversion that he's taken. But this is uh, the last step and the most famous step. Most people have, have heard of his, his dilemma uh, going between his thoughts of, of, I want to do this, I want to live in the world, but I want to follow God. I want to give him everything. If, and and uh, we've been reading uh, The Spiritual Combat by Dom Lorenzo um, uh, 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 Scopoli. And, and, and this is one of the things that we have for our battle is our mind, our imagination. And that's what the battle ta is taking place in Augustine's mind of, of uh, how he thinks. And many of us uh, may have gone through the whole same battle of, should I join the Catholic Church or not? Or should I give my whole life to God or not? People, young people who are considering the convent or the priesthood, they will go through this whole conversation in their mind that Augustine did. They'll find companionship and, and someone who would understand in Augustine over their dilemma and, and their, their trying to sort out uh, what life do they want. And so this is book 8, chapter 6. And now I will declare and confess to your name, O Lord, my helper and redeemer, how you delivered me out of bounds of carnal desire by which I was bound most firmly, and out of slavery to worldly things. Amid increasing anxiety, I was doing my usual business and daily sighing to you. I attended church whenever I was free from the business under the burden of which I groaned. Olympias was with me. Now free from his legal office after his third term as assessor and awaiting clients to whom to sell his counsel as I sold the skill of speaking, if indeed teaching can impart it. To please us, Nebridius had consented to teach under Verticundus, a citizen and a grammarian of Milan, and an intimate friend of us all, who had urgently requested, and by right of friendship challenged from our group, the faithful aid he needed. Nebridius was not drawn to do this by any desire to gain, for he, he might have made much more from his education if he had chosen to do so. But as a most kind and gentle friend, he would not let our request go unanswered. But he did it all very discreetly, taking care not to become known to those personages considered great by the world. Thus he avoided distraction of mind, wanting to leave himself free to seek, to read, or hear something concerning wisdom. So he mentioned his friends there, Olypius was a very dear friend of, of uh, Augustine and also was converted with him. And he later became a bishop of the Sea of Tagast in what is now Algeria. And so he was a lifelong friend of Augustine. Nebridius also joined Augustine in, in the conversion. And Ver, Vercon, Vericon. Verecundus uh, was an uh, older man that was very much um, loved by the people in his wisdom. And, and so uh, Nebridius agreed to teach uh, 
under his tutelage, under his um, guidance. Sort of like uh, Verkundius ran a school and Nebridius was one of the teachers at the school. On a certain day then, Nebridius was away for some reason I cannot recall. He was an African... Um, a man named Ponticianus came to see Olypius and me. He was an African who held high office in the emperor's court. What he wanted of us, I do not know. But we sat down to converse, and it happened that he observed a book on the table. He opened it, and to his surprise found it to be the epistles of St. Paul. He had thought it would be one of those books which I was wearing myself out in teaching. Looking at me with a smile, he, he expressed his joy and wonder that he had suddenly found this book, and this only, before my eyes. For he was a baptized Christian and often bowed himself before you. Our God, in the church, in constant and daily prayer. That when I told him that I studied these scriptures with much care, we fell into conversation about Antony the Egyptian monk, whose name was held in high regard by your people, though up to this time not familiar to us. When he learned this, he dwelt more on that subject, amazed at our ignorance of one so famous. And we also were amazed hearing of your wonderful works done in the true faith and Catholic Church, in times so recent, almost in our own time, and so fully attested. We all wondered, we, we, that they were so great, and that he, we all wondered, we, that they were so great, and he, that we knew nothing about them. From this, his conversation turned to the large numbers in the monasteries and their holy ways a sweet-smelling savor to you in the fruitful deserts of the wilderness, of which we knew nothing. There was a monastery at Milan, full of good brothers, just outside the city walls, under the protection of Ambrose, but we did not know it. He went on with his talk, and we listened intently and in silence. He then told us how one afternoon at Trier, when the emperor was taken up with the Sicentian games, he, Pontensianus, and three friends went out for a walk in the gardens near the city walls. There, as they happened to walk in pairs, one of them went apart with him, one of them went apart with him, while the other two wandered by themselves. These in, the wander these, in their wanderings, came on a certain cottage inhabited by some of your servants, poor in spirit of whom is the kingdom of heaven, and, and there they found a little book containing the life of Antony. One of them began to read it, admire it, and was inflamed by it. As he read, he began to consider taking up such a life, and giving up his worldly service to serve you. He and his companion were two of those they call agents for public affairs. Suddenly, filled with holy love and a, and a sober sense of shame, angry with himself, he looked at his friend and said, Tell me, please, what do we gain by all these labors of ours? What are we aiming at? What do we serve for? Can our hopes in court rise higher than to be the emperor's favorites? And in such a position, what is there that is not fragile and full of danger? And by how many perils will we arrive at even greater peril? And when will we arrive there? But if I desire to become a friend of God... I can do so at once. And so he said. And in the pangs of travail with new life, he turned his eyes again on the book and read on and was inwardly changed. 
as you saw. His mind was divested of the world as soon became evident. For as he read, and the waves of his heart rolled up and down, he stormed at himself a while. Then he saw and resolved on a better course. And now having become yours, he said to his friend, Now I have broken loose from those false hopes and am determined to serve God. From this hour, in this place, I enter that service. If you will not imitate me, don't oppose me. His friend answered that he would stick with him to partake of so glorious a reward, so glorious a service. So both of them, now being yours, were building a tower at the necessary cost, forsaking all they had and following you. Then Pontesianus and his friend, who was with him, who had been walking in other parts of the garden, came in search of them to the same place. On finding them, they reminded them to return, as the day was declining. But the others, relating their resolution and purpose, and how the resolve had begun, and had become confirmed in them, begged them not to molest them if they would not join them. Pontius and his friends, though, not changed from their former state, nevertheless, as he told us, bewailed themselves and piously congratulated their friends and commended themselves to their prayers. So with hearts lingering on the earth, they went away to the palace. But the other two, fixing their hearts on heaven, remained in the cottage. Both of them were engaged to be married. Their, uh, their fi uh, fiancéed brides, when they heard of this, also dedicated their virginity to you. I once had someone say that they didn't want to teach uh, about the the uh, early monks, hermits of the early church, like St. Anthony, to uh, catechumens, because they thought they wouldn't be interested. And here, just the reading the story of Anthony in a little cottage, turned these two uh, agents for public affairs to completely give up their line of work and to become followers of you, dear Lord, to give their lives totally to you. And they, at that time, they probably went off to join the monastery uh, that were outside Milan. And Pontius, who just heard their story, he and his friend also, without giving up their line of work, they too became Christians. So four people, just by one of them reading the little book of Anthony, converted all, all the other three as well to Christianity. Two, so much that they gave up their whole line of work to just serve God. It might be reading this myself. Maybe this is where I got the idea of living my life completely for the Lord. Of, of not um, working for others for their income, but to work only for God. So chapter 7 of this book 8. Such was the story of Pontius, but you, O oh Lord, were focusing it on myself while he was speaking, taking me from behind my own back where I had placed myself, being unwilling to look at myself. I love that line. It just, uh, taking me from behind my own back where I had placed myself, being unwilling to look at myself. And you set me before my own face so that I might see how foul I was, how crooked and sordid, how bespotted and ulcerous. 
I looked and loathed myself, but I could find nowhere to flee from myself. If I tried to turn my eyes from myself, Ponticius went on with his story. And you again set me face to face with myself and thrust me before my eyes, that I might discover my iniquity and hate it. I had known it, but acted as though I did not see it, winked at it, and forgot it. But now, the more ardently I loved those whose wholesome affections I heard about, men who had given themselves up wholly to you to be healed, the more I abhorred myself compared to them. For many years, perhaps twelve, had gone by since my nineteenth year, when I was stirred to an earnest love of wisdom on reading Cicero's Hortensius. Yet I was still delaying to reject mere worldly happiness to devote myself to search out that of which not only the finding, but the very search itself was preferable to the treasures and kingdoms of the world. Though already found and to the pleasures of the body, though spread around me at my will. But I, wretched young man, most wretched, even in the very earliest days of my youth, had, had prayed to you for chastity in this way. Give me chastity and continency, but not yet. For I was afraid that you would hear me too soon, and too soon deliver me from the disease of lust, which I wish to have satisfied rather than extinguished. And I had wandered through crooked ways in a sacrilegious superstition, not indeed assured of it, but preferring it to the truth, which, had, which I did not seek religiously, but rather opposed maliciously. I had thought that I delayed rejecting my worldly hopes from day to day and following only you because there did not appear any way by which to direct my course. But now the day had come to which I was to be laid bare to myself and my conscience was to upbraid me. Where are you now, my tongue? You said that you did not like to cast off the baggage of vanity for certain truth. Now truth is certain, yet that burden still oppresses you, while they who have neither worn themselves out with seeking it, nor for ten years and more have been thinking about it, have had their shoulders unburdened and received wings to fly away. Thus I was inwardly consumed and confused with horrible shame while Ponticius was speaking. Having finished his tale and the business he came for, he went away, and I into, my, and I into myself. What did I say that was not against myself? With what scourges and condemnation did I not lash my soul, that it might follow me, striving to go after you? Yet it drew back, it refused, but did not excuse itself. All arguments were exhausted and confuted. There remained a silent shrinking away. My soul feared, as it would fear death, to be restrained from the continuation of that habit by which it was actually wasting away to death. He still has a very, very hard time with his passions of lust and his love for things of the world. Could he give that up to live for God? And that was his struggle. That's what he was wondering and debating about within himself. Can I? Can I? I 
And so he continues with this struggle in chapter 8. In the midst of this great battle in my heart, which I had strongly raised up against my soul, troubled in mind and continence, I turned upon Olypius. What is wrong with us? I exclaimed. What is it? What did you hear? The unlearned start up and take heaven by force? And we with all our learning, but lacking heart, wallow in flesh and blood? Are we ashamed to follow because others have gone before us? And not ashamed instead that we are not following? I uttered some such words as these, and in my excitement I, I flung myself away from him while he stood looking at me in astonished silence. For it was not my usual tone, and my forehead, my cheeks, my eyes, color, and tone of my voice all expressed my emotion more than the words. A little garden lay outside our lodging, which we had the use of as we did the whole house, for the owner of the house, our landlord, was not living there. The tumult of my breast drove me there, where, where no man might interfere with a raging battle in which I had become engaged with myself. How it should end, you knew, but I did not. But I was mad to be whole and dying to live, knowing what an evil thing I was, and not knowing what good thing I was shortly to become. I retired then into the garden with Olypius on my steps. His presence was no bar to my privacy. How, how could he forsake me when I was in such a state? We sat down as far away from the house as possible. I was troubled in spirit, most vehemently angry with myself that I had not entered your will and covenant. Oh my God, which all my bones cried out to me to enter, praising it to the skies. We do not enter that will by ships or chariots or feet nor even by going as far as I had come from the house to that place where we were sitting. For not only to go, but to enter your will was nothing else but to will to enter. Resolutely and completely. Not to swagger and to sway about with a changeable and half-divided will, struggling with itself, one part sinking with another up. Finally, in the fever of my irresolution, I made many of those motions that my body, that men sometimes would like to, but cannot, because they do not have the limbs, or, or whose limbs are bound or weakened with infirmity, or are hindered in any other way. Thus, if I tore my hair or beat my forehead or if locking my fingers together or I clasped my knee, I did this because I willed it. But I might have willed it and not done it if the power of motion in my limbs did not respond. So many things I did where to will was not the same as having the power and I did not do what I longed incomparably more to do. But if I had willed thoroughly, I could have done it, for then I would have had the power to do it. In these things, power is one with the will, and the will is to do. Yet, it was not done. My body was more easily obeyed the slightest wish of my mind in moving its limbs and its directions than the soul obeyed itself to carry out its strong will, which only can be accomplished within the will alone.
And so a will is not something that, to enter the will of God is not something you do by, by a ship or a chariot or even walking. So entering the will of God was not from leaving the house into going into the garden where he sat. That's not doing entering the will of God. But it's the, but you can have the power, he said, to move your feet and you clasp your hands. But it's only God can help you to enter his will. And that's what he is wishing for. And yet he does not have the strength to do it on his own. 9. Chapter 9. Where does this monstrous condition come from? And why is it? Let your mercy shine on me that I may inquire if the obscurity of man's punishments and the darkest contritions of the sons of Adam may possibly offer an answer. Where does this monstrous condition come from and why is it? The mind commands the body and it obeys instantly. The mind commands itself and is resisted. The mind commands the hands to be moved. And such readiness is there that you can hardly distinguish the command from its fulfillment. Yet the mind is mind, the hand is body. The mind commands the mind to will. And yet though it is itself that which commands it, it does not obey. Where does this monstrous condition come from and why is it? I repeat, it commands itself to will and would not command unless it willed. Yet what it commands is not done. But it does not will completely. Therefore, it does not command completely. For so far as it wills, it commands. And so far as a thing commanded is not done, it does not will. For the will commands that there be a will, but it does not command entirely. Therefore, what it commands does not come about. If the will were whole, it would not even command it to be, because it would already be. So it is not strange partly to will and partly to be unwilling, but is actually an infirmity of the mind that it cannot wholly rise, borne up by truth, but is weighed down by habit. In short, there are two wills, because one is not whole, and one has what the other lacks. This is a good explanation, it's rather confusing, of our fight of our own will. He says you can will to move your bodies and your hands and, and in an instant they move without even thinking that you willed that they move right now. And you hold up your palms, you will to do that. And yet you will to follow God and yet you don't do it. And yet your mind will to do it, but it does not obey. Why? When it even wills it, why doesn't it obey? When, when your hands obey, why doesn't your will obey your mind to follow the will of God? And that's what he's asking, and that's what he's struggling with. Where is it? Where does this monstrous condition come from that you can't do what you're willing to do? That the habits of the earth and the pleasures of the world are so ingrained that you cannot overcome them to follow the will of God. Where does this monstrous condition come from and why is it? 
And that's what he's asking. He asked it three times in this chapter 9. Where does this monstrous condition come from? And why is it? And we'll go into chapter 10 with his struggles. Let them perish from your presence, O God, as vain talkers and seducers of the soul perish. Because they see two wills, claim that there are two natures in us. One good and the other evil. And he's talking about the Manichaeans. They themselves are truly evil when they hold these evil opinions, and they shall become good when they hold the truth and assent to the truth. So your apostle may say to them, You were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. They, wishing to be light, not in the Lord, but in themselves, imagining the nature of the soul to be the same as God, become more gross darkness. Through their dreadful arrogance, they went further from you, the true light that enlightens everyone who comes into the world. Take heed what you say and blush for shame. Draw, me, draw near to him and be enlightened and your faces shall not be ashamed. Deliberate, deliberating upon serving the Lord my God at this time, as I had long proposed, it was I who willed, I who was unwilling. It was I, even I myself, I neither willed entirely nor was entirely unwilling. I was therefore at war with myself and torn apart by myself. And this destruction befell me against my will. Yet it did not show the presence of another mind, but the punishment of my own. Therefore it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in it. The punishment of a sin more freely committed in that I was a son of Adam. For if there were, are as many contrary natures as there are conflicting wills, there would now be not only two, but many. If a man deliberates whether he should go to their meeting or to the theater, the Manichaeans cry out, Behold, here are two natures, one good drawing this way, the other bad draws back that way. For from where does this hesitation between conflicting wills comes? But I say that both are bad, that that which draws him toward them is as bad as that which draws toward the theater. But they believe that the will is good, which inclines towards them. Suppose one of us should deliberate, and in the battle of two wills, be in a quandary whether to go to the theater or go to church. Would not these Manichaeans also be in a quandary as what to answer? For either they must confess, which they would not like to do, that the will which leads to our church is good, or they must suppose two evil natures and two evil minds in conflict with one man instead of seeing the truth, that in deliberation one man fluctuates between conflicting wills. Let them no longer say, when they see two conflicting wills in one man, that the conflict is between two contrary natures, between two opposing substances, from two opposing principles, one good and the other bad. For you, O true God, thus disprove, check, and convince them by facts. For instance, one deliberates whether he should kill a man by poison or by the sword, whether he should seize this or that estate of another's, when he cannot seize both, whether he should purchase pleasure by extravagance or keep his money by
by stinginess. Whether we should go to the circus or go to the theater. If both are open on the same day or make a third choice to rob another's house if he has the opportunity or even a fourth to commit adultery if at the same time he has the opportunity. All these concurring at the same point of time and all being equally desired but impossible to do at the same time tear the mind amid the four or even more conflicting wills. But they do not indicate that there are many different substances. So it is also in wills which are good. For I ask them, is it good to take pleasure in reading the Apostle? Or good to take pleasure in a psalm? Or good to discourse on the gospel? They will answer to each, it is good. What then if all give equal pleasure and all are offered at the same time? Do not different wills distract the mind while one deliberates which he would rather choose? Yet all of them are good and are at variance until one is chosen toward which the whole united will may move which was previously divided into several parts. Thus also when eternity delights us and the pleasure of temporal goods holds us down below, it is the same soul which wills neither way, which wills neither way with an entire will. And therefore it is torn asunder with grievous perplexities because its love of truth first throws, shows one way to be preferable while its habits keep it bound to the other. And so this chapter goes over of, of how many wills does a person have? How many natures does a person have? Well, the Manichaeans said that you had several natures. And, and, of course, the Catholic Church teaches you only have one nature and one soul. But the, you still are conflicting in, in, in your decision. And, and this chapter sort of goes away from what he's thinking, but he's telling the people how he thought, how his mind was so confused at this moment in time. Uh, he was drawn toward the will of doing the will of God, and yet he was also drawn toward just following the pleasures of the world that was his habit. And so one was preferable, but the other was desirable, and he couldn't leave it alone. And we'll stop there, and we'll um, have just a few more chapters left to, 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 to finish this, but we will stop there for now. Thank you. God bless. Hi, this is Kathy Moore, and this is Steps in a Journey. And we're continuing on with uh, Augustine's Confessions with chapter, uh, Book 8, Chapters 11 and 12. His last minutes of his decision to convert. Thus I was soul sick and tormented accusing myself much more severely than I usually did, tossing and turning myself in my chain till it should be utterly broken, for what held me now was slight indeed. And you, O Lord, pressed upon me inwardly with severe mercy, redoubling the lashes of fear and shame, lest I should give way again, and that slight remaining tie not being broken should recover its strength and bind me more strongly for I said to myself let it be done now let it be done now and as I spoke I did all but a firm resolve I almost did it but it did not yet I did not sink back to my own condi old condition but kept my position close enough to get my breath I, I tried again, 
and came very near reaching the point of resolve, then lacked even a little less, and then all I but touched and grasped it. Yet I still not quite make it, nor touch it, nor laid hold of it, hesitating to die to death and to live for life. The worst to which I had become habituated prevailed more with me than the better which I had not tried. In the very moment in which I was to become another man, the nearer it approached me, the greater horror it struck in me. Yet it did not strike me utterly back, nor turn me away, but held me in suspense. The very toys and vanities of vanities, my old mistresses, still held me. They plucked my fleshy garment and whispered softly, Are you going to part with us? From that moment shall we never be with you any more forever? And from that moment will this or that never be lawful to you forever? What did they suggest by those words, this or that? What was it which they suggested, O oh my God, that your mercy turn it away from my mind of your servant? What defilements they suggested? What shame! But now I did not hear them half so loudly, for they did not show themselves openly to contradict me, but muttered, as it were, behind my back furtively plucking at me as I was leaving to make me look back on them. Yet they did delay me, so that I hesitated to burst and shake myself free from them, and to leap over to where I was called to be. An unruly habit kept saying to me, Do you think that you can live without them? But now it was saying this very faintly. For on that side to which I had set my face, where I was trembling to go, the chaste dignity of continence appeared to me. Serene, unduly cheerful, honestly bidding me to come and doubt nothing. Continence extended her holy hands to receive and embrace me replete with multitudes of good examples. There were so many young men and maidens here, a multitude of youth and of every age, grave widows and aged virgins, and continence herself in all, not barren, but a fruitful mother of children of joys by you, her spouse, O Lord. She smiled on me with an encouraging mockery as if to say, Can you not do what these youths, what these maidens can? Or can any of them do it of themselves and not rather in the Lord Jesus Christ their God? The Lord their God gave me to them. What do you stand in your own strength? and thus not stand at all. Cast yourself fearlessly upon him. He will receive you and will heal you. And I blushed exceedingly at having listened to the muttering of those toys and hung in indecision. And she again seemed to say, Stop your ears against your unclean members, that they may be mortified. They tell you of delights, but not as does the law of the Lord your God. This conflict in my heart was self against self. But Lippius, sitting close by my side in silence, waited the outcome of my e unusual emotion. Now with his arguments, the Holy Spirit brings into his mind continence. And this is, this is a word hardly taught 
in today's youth and today's society continents of whatever your life is you are live a good pure holy life if you're married you still live a good pure holy life with your spouse if you're single you still live a good pure holy life and that's uh, one thing that they don't pray enough for in the churches very seldom do you hear prayers for the single and and I'm divorced and never maybe three times in all the years uh, almost the 30 years that I've been divorced maybe I three times to six times in my all these years have I heard prayers for those who are divorced and why do you think there's so many of them that then get remarried with an out annulment with no prayer behind them no one helping them with their through their prayer to remain pure good holy in their in their way of life And now he's arguing, and Continent says, and he's thinking, well, all these youth, these maidens, they were, they were uh, pure and holy, and, and he says, why can't I be that way? And Continence answered him and saying, how do you think they could do it without God? You can't. If you want to be this way, you have to turn to God. You need these prayers. Of your, of your own prayers as well as prayers of others to keep you on the straight and narrow path. So chapter 12. When my searching reflection had dredged up from the secret depths of my soul all my misery and piled it in the sight of my heart, a mighty storm rose. I like that the sentence. It dredged up from the secret depths of my soul all my misery and piled it up in the sight of my heart. A mighty storm arose, bringing a great shower of tears. To give full vent of, to them, I rose and left Olypius. Complete silent solitude seemed to me more appropriate for the business of weeping. So I retired so far that even his presence could not be a hindrance to me. He understood, for I suppose I had said something in which the tone of my voice appeared choked and weeping as I had risen up. So he stayed alone where we had been sitting. Still, completely astonished. I threw myself down. I, I knew not how under a certain fig tree giving vent to my tears. The streams of my eyes gushed out an acceptable sacrifice to you. It was not in these words yet to this purpose that I spoke much to you. But you, O oh Lord, how long? How long, Lord? Will you be angry forever? Remember not our former iniquities against us? For I felt that I was still held by them. I sent up these sorrowful cries. How long? How long? Tomorrow and tomorrow? Why not now? Why is there not an end to my uncleanness this very hour? I was speaking this way and weeping in the most bitter contrition of my heart when, when suddenly I heard from a neighboring house a voice, as of a boy or a, or a girl, I know not which, chanting repeatedly, Take up and read! Take up and read! My facial expression changed instantly and I began to think most earnestly whether children were in the habit of playing any kind of game with such words. I could not remember ever having heard anything like it. So checking the torrent of my tears, I got up, interpreting it to be nothing other than a command from God to open the book and to read the first chapter I could find. For I heard of Antony, 
that when he came in during the reading of these words in the gospel, go, sell all you have and give to the poor and you shall have treasure in heaven and come, follow me. He had received these words as addressed to himself and by such an oracle was immediately converted to you. So I quickly returned to the place where Olypius was sitting, where I had laid the volume of the apostle when I arose from there. I grabbed it, opened it, and in silence read the paragraph on which my eyes first fell. Not in reveling and drunkenness, not in debauchery and licentiousness, not in strife and envying, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. I read no further, nor did I need to. For instantly, at the end of this sentence, by a light, as it were, of serenity, of infused into my heart, all the darkness of doubt vanished away. Closing the book and putting my finger between the pages, I, I told Olypius about it with a calm countenance. He asked to look at what I had read. I showed him, and he read on even further than I had, and I did not know what followed. There it was written, Receive him that is weak in the faith which he applied to himself and showed it to me. He was strengthened by this admonition and by a good resolution and purpose very much in accord with his character, in which he was far different from me and far better. Without any restless delay, he joined me. Then we went then to my mother and told her, relating in order how it took place. And she leapt for joy, exalted and praised you who are able to do more than we ask or think. For she perceived that you had given her more for me than she had been praying for by her pitiful and most sorrowful groanings. For you converted me to yourself so that I sought neither wife nor any other hope of this world standing on that rule of faith on which you had showed me to her in a vision so many years before. And you turned her grief into a much more plentiful gladness than she had desired, in a much dearer and purer way than she used to crave when she asked for grandchildren of my body. And so that ends his conversion, the very last bit that won him over to the Lord. Hook, line, and sinker complete. Complete everything to the Lord to, to please his, give great joy to his mother and and uh, and his friend Lippius came along with him uh, and, and they were baptized together later on. But I, you know, if, if anyone is, is um, just given themselves over to the Lord. I know someone has said that, uh, people said, you have to become born again and be prayed for, for the baptism of the Spirit. And this lady said she she resisted these friends for, for a long time. And then finally, she says, okay. And she said her life was never the same again. And, and I remember uh, myself, the fear that came over me. What, what is God going to ask of me? And the, and the fear was not unlike a, a fear of heights. A great terror came over me, um, which I couldn't move. And, and my friend who was with me extended her hand, and I couldn't take it. And so she left me to my thoughts, and I... And I thought about uh, fears of heights, fears, and how my mother was so afraid of heights. And I didn't know it until I was in college. Yes, you know, when growing up, 
I lived I lived in the trees and mother mother never gave me the fear of heights she would just um, so I didn't notice that and and when we were traveling and we were could go up a ski uh, ski lift in the summertime as a tourist attraction she didn't go up it and we just I just thought well there the, the seats only held three so dad and my sister and I went up it and, and I didn't think twice about mom not going up it and when we would go up uh, in, in Wisconsin and Door County to up the fire tower Mom never went up it. I, I never thought about it as a child. Well, here I was in college, and we went to Disneyland. And we talked Mom into going on a, a gondola ride. And all the way up the long line, she wanted to turn around and, and go back. And Mom, you can't buck the line. Here in line, you have to go the direction. You can't go against the line. So then we got in the gondola, which held four people, and we're going across Disneyland. And I was saying, Mom, there's a pirate ship we just were, saw. And, Mom, there's mermaids down there. And each time she said, uh-huh, uh-huh. Well, then I exclaimed something, and I looked at her. She was not moving her head right or left. She was not seeing anything. She was petrified. I never had known her fear of heights, and I was in college. In fact, I might have even been out of college by that time. No, it was, I was still in college. I just remember the next incident. So then, the next time, we went up. Uh, I worked in the Tetons, and my folks came and visited me while I was working there for the summer. So I was in college then, and I knew about Mom's fear of heights. And we, we took the gondola to the top of, of the Tetons up there. Uh, it was uh, where they go skiing. And the gondola held about uh, 15 or, or lots of people. I, I don't know how many. But going up in this, it goes up straight up, a mile up to the top. And Mom wasn't afraid of going in this because it was a large container. And so I was the first one off, and I ran to the top of the mountain, and you could then look over into Idaho from the top of the mountains and oh what a grand and glorious view you had you could look look toward Wyoming and the and the uh, Teton Range and uh, um, Valley and you could look over into Idaho and so I ran back to the gondola because I, I knew mom's fear of heights and and I wanted to help her and so I ran back to the gondola and sure enough everyone had come off out of the gondola but herself and just as she was about to step across from the gondola to land the wind blew and there was a crack between the gondola and land like just two inches and a look of fear came over my mom's face but just for an instant and she just smiled and she says, I think I'll stay here. Well, you know, you look through that crack and it's a mile straight down. And so I knew that why she was wanting to stay there. But I wanted what I wanted her to have what I had. And so I said, I had extended my hand and I said, Mom, come along, I'll I'll help you across. And she took the step across to land and was then was able to come up to the top of the mountain and look down over the mountaintops of the Teton Range and, and into Idaho or into Wyoming and it was a glorious time and I I was thinking of these things now was it was it, now the, my thoughts were to give my life to the Lord or not and And Mary spoke to me and she said, Remember how happy you were on the mountaintop? 
And I said, yes. And she said, that's how it is with God. And I said, but you can't make a living on the mountaintop. And she said, God will provide. And my friend came back and, and she offered her hand to help me across that barrier of fear. Just like I had offered my mom a hand. Because my friend wanted me to have what she had. And I had offered my hand to mom so that she could have what I had. So I understood this completely. And I accepted my friend's hand. And we both were engulfed in the Holy Spirit and we, we sat down on chairs that she had nearby and we both rested in the Spirit sitting there. And, and you know, years later, Brother Mauricio was, is in Anacortes and visiting and we showed him, we took him up on Mount Erie and he said later on, he says, remember how happy you were up on the mountaintop? And I, I exclaimed, that's exactly what Mary said to me when I was baptized in the Spirit, the exact same words. But lots of times we are scared. He knew, Augustine knew the pleasures of the past, but he didn't know what God was going to expect of him in the future. And, and that's how it is so scary, the fear of the future. Will God provide? You know, that's the trust. I've, I've given talks that are on YouTube on trusting in the Lord. Trusting that He will provide. And this is, uh, you know, then, he, then uh, he was given the song, Take Up and Read, Take Up and Read. And he just opened the book to and read what he what the first words that came apart uh, came uh, that he put his hand on and it fit him completely give up this way of life and come into the presence of the Lord um, I've heard priests say don't do that you know don't read the Bible that way and yet Saint Anthony read it that way he heard the scripture and applied it to himself and and I've read uh, I mean, Augustine did the same thing and applied that scripture to himself. And w I did it. Uh, and I, I did it three times. And each time I got a different scripture on, on going forth and pr teaching about Jesus. All three times uh, that I did this for, you know, what do you want me to do, Lord? Not open up the Bible and... And I did it three times, and all three were the same, is, is teaching others about the wonders of Jesus, about his benefits, his love, his graces, his, his providence, his friendship, his mercy. So, uh, see you next week on, or the next time about, uh, we'll go into book tw Book 9 of Augustine's um, Confessions. Thank you and God bless you.